Cheers, everyone, and welcome back to Lim's Cryptoverse. Today, I want to focus on Nier's innovation. So I'm not going to do a deep dive. I'm going to do that later. But I am going to talk to you a little about the rating scorecard that I have, which is basically the framework and backbone of the deep dive. So the way I made this presentation is I made it kind of wordy, not because I'm going to read everything word for word. What I want you to do is uh, to be able to pause the presentation and record or print out the, the particular slide, whatever, because there's a lot to talk about. So let's get going. So the overview is, of course, I'm not going to just talk about near. I'm going to talk about an overview of the crypto market, maybe the macro market. Then we're going to do an intro to near. You, if you really want to know the project, you could just go on a website like uh, Coin Bureau and get a background of it. And then the second thing I want to talk to you about is a rating scorecard I mentioned before. And what I really want to spend most of the time is on the technology and innovation of NEAR. And that technology in terms of how the NEAR protocol works and the programming and the technical knowledge and information, but on a recent innovation of NEAR. And then we're going to have a conclusion. So this is going to be a body, mind, spirit. I always like to say that. What I mean is when I look at crypto projects, I always, always, always use a holistic approach. So crypto, what's going on? Are we in the crypto winter still? I think we're still in the crypto winter. If not, I still think we're in, uh, I, th if we're, I, I think if we're not in crypto winter, I should say, I think we're in the bull market, but I still think we're going to have a pullback. And there's many reasons why. I actually wrote a piece on this called Bitcoin's Dubious Rally, which also pertains to crypto because crypto moves with Bitcoin. And I talked about a lot of short-term risks. So I'm just only going to give you a few of them. Uh, the first one is a seasonality. Between August and October, I don't know, 19th. I think that was a crash, right? Crash of 1987. I think it was October 19th, something like that. But basically, this is a very weak time period for all risk assets. So that's a a big no-no. So you don't want to be investing in anything at this point. And there's also short-term and long-term risk like CBDCs, DC, central bank digital currencies. There's still a lot of regulatory risks. There's some distribution from large holders like whales. Sentiment has been too greedy. A Fed liquidity, Federal Reserve liquidity is still tight despite what happened in March, if you recall, in March, it was a banking crisis. And so the Federal Reserve, including China, they, they increased liquidity, but lot, that liquidity is going bye-bye. And then let, negative, uh, lastly, there's a lot of negative on-chain net uh, metrics. The on-chain metrics, and most of my data became extremely bullish uh, at the bottom of Bitcoin and crypto around November, December 2022. And at that time, I put out a video saying I was bullish on all risk assets and Bitcoin and crypto. But I said that we were not at the bottom. I said we were at a bottom, not at the bottom. So if I did make a mistake, it's that I thought it was a short-term bottom and not the long-term bottom. Now here, if you look at this chart, you could see that the put-to-core ratio in terms of volume is near an all-time low. And you could see that's in the blue text there. So uh, that's a contrarian indicator. So when the when the put to core ratio is at a low, that's very bearish. So beware. And we're seeing the same thing with Ethereum. So beware. I think uh, Bitcoin and crypto could go down, I don't know, another 20, 30%. I, I don't think we're going to break the low in Bitcoin. The low in Bitcoin, I think it was, well, there was an intraday low. Um, let's just call it 17,000, 18,000. I don't think we'd go much lower than that. There's just too much strong, long-term bullish factors. And remember, we got the halving coming up. And the closer we get to the halving, the higher the probability of the whole crypto market uh, going up. So what I'm saying is I'm, I'm bearish only short term. So near protocol, we're, um, I'm looking at the market today. We're kind of weak because the stock market's weak. So near protocol is trading around a dollar thirty, and if you look at this chart, this is a chart of near protocol in U.S. dollars. It looks pretty good. Well, some people might say it's like flattened line, like an EKG machine, like there's no heartbeat. But 
to me, it, the chart looks good, at least from this point of view. When you look at the stock, I'm calling it a stock chart. It's like flat line. So at least it's not going down. But the problem is, if you look at this next chart, this is the near uh, coin divided by Bitcoin. And it's been a long downward trend. So what you want to see here is this flat line. You want to, you want to see it staying flat. So now, at least for the last whatever it was, I'm sorry, I don't have the time period here. But for the last six months or so, it's been flat. So that's what you want to see. So you want to see relative strength of near versus Bitcoin. So I think we're near the bottom in near. But but if the Bitcoin market, like I said earlier, if Bitcoin goes down, I think near could go down to maybe a dollar. If near goes down to a dollar, that would be very good because um, on a price to book value basis, near is very cheap. I think it's about 1.6 times on the price to book value. So if the uh, price of near goes down lower, let's say it goes down to a dollar, that price to book value would probably go down to around 1.3. But anything below two or three is really good. So, so you, it's a very, um, believe it or not, it's a very good um, uh, project or coin uh, based on using Graham and Dodd analysis, if you will. So background, so this, like I said, this is not a deep dive. So let's talk about uh, near and term, loosely in terms of, you know, what is it? And I think most of you know what near is anyway. It's basically a layer one cryptocurrency, cryptocurrency blockchain with smart contract functionality, which is basically almost like every layer one. It's designed to be developer friendly and facilitate the creation of decentralized apps. So one issue, my major issue that I have with Near is that it's designed and made for developers. And that's it. It's, it, it the joke is that they have no uh, marketing department. They're, they're too uh, developer friendly. But now they're moving towards becoming more consumer friendly. And very few people know this that it's actually interoperable with Ethereum. And this is all new stuff that's going on. I'm going to be discussing in a few weeks from now on, on my deep dive that they've got multiple ways of becoming Ethereum and other blockchain friendly. Like they have the Neon EVM that, that's going to be coming out. And they have something else called Rainbow. And they have something else. I can't remember the third one. But basically... I almost came to me. Basically, these are methods that allow Near, and including its developers, to work with other blockchains. For example, Near doesn't just use one language, which is Rust. It uses other languages. And for example, you can use Java on it. And this is going to segue into what we're talking about today. And Near uses a sharding mechanism called Nightshade. I don't want to get too into this. But basically, near there's, there's lots of, uh, let me go back. Near uses sharding. And Ethereum's going to be using sharding. And Harmony uses sharding. Elrond in Multiverse X, that's the new, new, new name for eGold, basically, Elrond. They use sharding too. But near sharding mechanism appears to be more advanced than its competitive layer one blockchain. So just keep that in mind. I'm, I'm not going to talk to you too much about that. The team, I think uh, Nier has one of the best teams out there, uh, formed by, as I say, two brilliant minds, Alexander Skidanov and Ilya Palashukin. Of course, these are Russian names. And they met uh, during a Y Carbonate, y -carbonate startup celery program I believe that's in San Francisco. And I think you all know why Carbonate. They, they started some of the largest and best known um, companies and projects, including Coinbase. And if you look at Ilya, he looks like, uh, he's really buff. He looks like uh, something from an animated uh, movie. So he looks like, a, like he's, he works out in a gym more than he programs, but he's a smart guy. And so my question is, is there room for another layer one? As I mentioned, there's many layer ones. They all sound the same. You know, they're all proof of stake, on and on. I'm not going to read this to you. But 
my point is I, I'm a big believer in Pareto's principle. And if you don't know Pareto, Pareto's principle, uh, you could read this definition here. And it, it's, it's used in everything. It's used in natural law, physics. It's used in schooling, psychology. It's used in business. And here on this chart, it says 20% of the input, time, resources, accounts for 80% of the output. So I believe that 20% of the bl blockchains are going to account for 80% of the market share. So this doesn't mean, just mean that Ethereum is going to take over all the blockchain. I think there's going to be a, lots of room, because this is going to be a big, humongous market. There's going to be lots of room for specialized chains. Like Algorand, for example, has a very close connections with institutions and governments. So maybe they're going to be the blockchain for central bank digital currencies. And Solana um, used to be the blockchain for decentralized finance because it's so fast. Now it looks like it's moving towards NFTs. So I think um, NIR could also be a specialized blockchain. So I don't think they're going to disappear. So before we talk about NIR, let's talk in terms of that technology innovation, let's talk about a rating scorecard. I give them an A. Why? Because they excel in so many areas. So there's only have two weaknesses and you, I put them in red. So let's quickly go through these, including the, what I like about them. Funding, excellent funding, one of the highest funding projects. As of June, they've got $900 million in funding. Magic team, as I said, is excellent. They won all kinds of awards. Technology is excellent, including uh, zero knowledge proofs, which is like what you see with layer twos, dynamic charting, private shards, which is very important, especially for, for companies, private companies. Uh, developers above average, we've seen some decline in developer growth, so we need to monitor that because it's been declining quickly. But overall, because you have to always compare chains, not just alone, standing alone, but with other projects and what I could tell you is that developer growth, but other chains have, have also been declining anyway. So that's why I put for developers, devs, dev growth is above, above average because it's done above average over the last two years. Uh, user experience is average. They're working towards uh, making that a mission and making that the key point. We're going to talk about that later. Use case is above average. Uh, oh, Octopus, I mentioned about interoperability with Ethereum. I mentioned Rainbow and Neon EVM. I forgot to mention Octopus and Aurora. Aurora is similar to like an Ethereum layer two. I'm not going to talk about that. I would do that in deep dive. Ecosystem. Ecosystem is below average because there's minimal DAP diversity. You want to see a lot of DAPs, and we don't, we're don't. we not seeing that yet. And they, this, they had a sunset, the algorithmic uh, Stablecoin, bad timing. <laughs> they got hit with the Terra Luna crisis. And there hasn't been any hype in NIR. No one knows NIR. Decentralization, that's been a key issue for uh, NIR. They only had like 50 to 100 validators a few years ago, two years ago. Now they've grown to 215 validators, and they do have a Nakamoto coefficient of eight. So it's not that bad. So they're moving quickly into, uh, I should say they're moving into becoming decentralized. Maybe they're not moving quick enough for Gary Gensler at the SEC. Tokenomics was horrible because of a terrible vesting schedule, but now tokenomics is good and above average. They don't have a max, but similar to a project with a max supply because um, the Genesis Supplies one billion, and the, the total supply is only one point one five, so it's not much above max. And the circulant supply is very high. So in terms of Solana, for example, I think they're very similar. Actually, I think tokenomics for near is a bit better than um, Solana because near's inflation is five percent, but doesn't have much of an inflation schedule. It's going to be mostly five percent, and then come down uh, once they have lots of volume. Uh, inflation for uh, Solana has been high at about 9%, but it's coming down quickly. And circuit supply for uh, NIR is better than for Solana, but Solana has much more staking. Solana has a huge supply that stakes. So overall, I'd say NIR is just a little better than Solana in terms of tokenomics. 
Socials, they're very similar, Nier and Solana. Social is excellent, considering how small Nier is. I think Nier is only ranked 38 on coin market, coin market cap. However, they have 1.9 million Twitter followers. That's extremely high social engagement, considering how small the Nier protocol is. So that's really, really good. Next, near a special source. So here's the, the crux of what I want to talk to you about in this presentation. And you could print these out because I'm going to talk quickly. Near is going to be helping transition corporations and Web2 companies like Facebook, Metabook, Metaverse into Web3. So they're going to transition corporations from Web2 to Web3. Very important. So the special source is what I call BOSS, the blockchain, blockchain operating system. And th it's going to combine all the advantages of Web3 for those incumbent firms like legacy firms while getting rid of all the disadvantages of Web2 and Web3. Again, so it's going to be keeping the advantages of Web3 and Web2 and getting rid of all the disadvantages. So it's like the best of both worlds. So, uh, okay, this is me have to print out. There's a lot to say here. But any, by the way, before we go on, anytime someone tells you that there's no use case for Web3, I want you to give them this list, give them this long list here. So I'm going to cover them quickly and you can print them out. The first advantage is that Web3 is decentralized. There's no single central authority controlling the data. So it enhances security and transparency. There's uh, the second point. There's data ownership. I own my data and there's privacy and this, this data ownership is portable. Number three, there's censorship resistance. The government can't say, hey, tell me all you know about this person. So it ensures freedom of speech. It's interoperable without a blockchain. The seamless communications. Next point, it allows so smart contracts that self-execute because they have free predefined rules and conditions. It allows for tokenization of real world assets like real estate or physical assets, or it allows for digital, meaning physical and digital. And that, and that talks of, that goes into the world of NFTs, non-fungible tokens. Next point, the records become immutable. They cannot be changed. Yet they could also be audited by a third party. Uh, third to last point, it reduces middlemen, which means it lowers fees. Think about Amazon. Before Amazon, if you want to buy a pair of shoes, you had to go to the retail store. Well, maybe maybe go to like a magazine like Roadrunner Sports to get your sneakers. But what Amazon did, it disintermediated the retail store. It got it basically went in between you and the retail store. So that's very good. You're reducing middlemen. Uh, middlemen, like I said. Uh, second to last point, this community governance, DAOs. And as a matter of fact, speaking of DAOs, near protocol, I, I told you they had a huge $900 million treasury. They have shifted their treasury from being centralized to being run by multiple DAOs. And last point, there's incentives for participation, such as staking, staking rewards. Next, so how do we onboard the next 1 billion users? It won't be by trading amongst ourselves, because in the last bull market, what really happened with all these DAPs and all this total value locked is all we were, we were really doing was buying and selling uh, coins on DEXs. To me, that's not a killer app. We desperately need a killer app that transitions that and 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 gets gets us gets us out of speculation and gambling into real authentic use cases. So perhaps someone in Web two land, some of those legacy companies that are really good at what they do, maybe they can help us. So we need a carrot. So Near can handhold them and allow, allow these legacy uh, companies to cross the chasm from Web 2 into Web 3. So what, I'm, I'm talking about an operating system as a metaphor, by the way. Me, like near, I'm getting tongue-tied here because I'm trying to explain this to you. This is complex. Near is like a blockchain 
operating system, but it's not. I'm just trying to give you more like a metaphor. So let's talk about what is a traditional OS operating system. Uh, they are like the ones that we all know, like Microsoft Windows, Mac OS, iOS for the Apple iPhone, and of course that little guy there on the right, that's um, Android, Google Android. It is also, speaking of Google and Alphabet, there's also the Google Chrome operating system that you might see on um, like a like on um, iPad competitor. So these chains, not chains, I'm sorry, these operating systems also act as middlemen between hardware and software applications. So they allow people like you and me that are not technical, they allow them to use um, a hardware and software applications. And this is a huge market of $45 billion. So if the global operating system is $45 billion, um, just imagine how big the, the so-called operating system is for uh, Web 2 and Web 3. It's used, huge. We're talking giganormous trillions of dollars here. So here's a schematic from Near Protocol, I should have sourced this, that shows you how Near is solving the problems for both Web 2 and Web 3. So you can read this on your own. I'm just gonna pick, uh, pick up on one or two points. So some of the disadvantages of Web 2 are that it can be uh, censored. And, and there's also lack of data ownership, lack of privacy. It's much easier to hack. So you hear a lot about hacks on crypto, but it's, it's easy to hack and steal personal information on Web2. So these are gonna uh, disappear, all these are disadvantages that you see in green on the left side here. And you're gonna get all the advantages of Web3, Web like onboarding, there's gonna be a lower complexity to, to build. There's going to be cross-platform cross support. So there's going to be a lot going on. It's going to be better distribution. So distribution basically means, means making it easier for people like you and me to get onto a, a blockchain. We're not even knowing that we're on the blockchain. Like you don't know what I'm using right now. You don't know if I'm using PowerPoint. You don't know if I'm using iMovie, YouTube, Zoom. You just want to. You just want to see the presentation. That's what I'm talking about. We want cryptocurrency to be behind a cryptocurrency blockchain to be behind the scenes, and that's where Neo comes in. And I didn't talk about the right side here. Web three. The problem. The disadvantages of Web three is that there's too many protocols, too many languages. It's complicated to use the ux the user experience is terrible right have you ever gone on blockchain or, or transferred money or did something you have to put in a, uh, the address and it's complicated you make one mistake and you're screwed so this is why i think near's blockchain operating system as they're calling it is going to be the holy grail moving from web 2 to web 3. next slide so I'm only going to talk to you about a few points here. You can print this out. So near blockchain operating system was re uh, introduced recently, just a few months ago in March, and allows developers to build any blockchain using their favorite language. And I talked to you about in the previous slide how near is very good at um, allowing this. Uh, what else did I want to talk to you about? Oh yeah, I have it highlighted here. Uh, near with Boss acting as a middleman is going to allow users to easily connect and onboard with many applications without the requirement of even owning Bit Crypto. I, I think that's an amazing. And as I mentioned, it's going to be interoperable. So on the last bullet here, as I said, this is difficult for me to explain. It's kind of like how sausage is made. Because when near is it near is not really a, an operating system like Windows. It's more than that. So I was using it as a metaphor. What it really is is a software software stack, and I'm going to show you on the next slide. And you can print this out yourself. But this is just a schematic of what's really going on behind the scenes of what I had called a software uh, blockchain operating system. Next, traditional metrics. Traditional metrics. And you can use any website. You can go to, to the uh, Nears Explorer. You can go to Token Terminal. You can go to Artemis. You can go to Dune Analytics. If you go to these websites, 
you do not see rapid growth arising from the blockchain operating system. I don't know why. I think it's too early. So I just want to show you here, for example, near is in, I think it's gray. Yeah, near is gray. And you could see it's pretty flat line. At least it's not going down. It looks like everything's flat in line. And this is why I said earlier, I still think we might be in a crypto winter. But at least NEAR is doing better than some other blockchains. I'd include Ethereum, obviously, because Ethereum is huge compared to, like off the charts, compared to uh, Solana and, and uh, Ethereum. I mean, I mean Solana and NEAR. So what I, I just what I just included was some similar, simil similarly sized layer one blockchains. And as I could see daily active addresses and transactions are flat. And the same thing with total value lock. Uh, it, it dived for a few reasons. Uh, number one, uh, Terra Luna, they got hit with Terra Luna. We got, they got hit with that, algorithm, that algorithmic coin, USN. We got hit with FTX in November 2022. And then there was an Al Alameda liquidity removal that occurred in April 23, so you could see it gone down dramatically, and you could see my uh, bullet here. They had over three billion total value locked in 2022. I think that was um, April, and now they've gone down to nothing, like under 100 million, and we've been pretty flat. However, this hope, and here's my next slide. There's a new adoption metrics for Boss. And this is coming from Missouri. They did a study, an article on the blockchain operating system. And what they said is there is evidence that developers are ramping up widgets related to the blockchain operating system. And you can think of a widget as a small piece of a web page or a DAP that is reusable, modular, configurable, and embeddable. And if you look at those, you could see they've been ramping up since the introduction, even before the introduction, of blockchain, the blockchain operating system. So that's a really good sign. So this is what we need to monitor uh, on near to see if there's adoption of the blockchain operating system. Now, I don't know if this is going to be available on um, Artemis or Token Terminal, but I suspect it's going to be available on Dune Ana Analytics. So what I suggest is you go on Dune and keep checking those uh, user-generated uh, analytics to see if there's one created for widgets for Neo. Upcoming events. So I think some key events is, first of all, there's going to be um, a town hall meeting. I think it's coming up soon, like in two weeks. I didn't put that on here. But what I want to tell you uh, about is on the bottom here, that's the symbol for Twitter. You could look at the uh, Neo's uh, Twitter sites. Uh, and they've got a few. they got the official Near one that's in green on the bottom. But then on the right side here, they got near SF because near is headquartered in San Francisco. And you can see what's going on uh, on Twitter and near San Francisco. And then in those two um, images there, I've got some two big uh, events coming up. The first event's coming up in Vietnam out of all places. And that's in September. I'm not sure how big that is. I think the big one's going to be coming up out in... Um, in Portugal, that's Neocon, November 7th through 10th this year in Portugal, or Lisbon. And I think that's going to be, in, uh, going to be have some may possible introductions uh, or catalyst for Near. And that's where we're going to see, like I said, introductions for, um, so the blockchain operating system, meaning there's going to be some, there's going to be some um, dApps showing you how they're using blockchain operating systems, and they're going to show you how I'm sure there's going to be some examples of Web2 companies transition to Web3 because of NEAR protocol. So why do we cheer for NEAR? Well, I think I've made that case already. I think during the next bull market for crypto, NEAR can once again pump. I think they're going to have the wherewithal to remain viable until that next crypto bull run because they have so much money in their treasury. And the last point I want to say is I think they're setting the stage for adoption. They, they've made a major mistake, as I mentioned, is that they, so, they have so, no so-called marketing department. This is a, a blockchain uh, designed by developers for developers. That's been a big mistake in my opinion. 
I think they need to transition their leadership from and from engineers. I mean, these are great guys, but need they need to transition that and choose someone that's able to speak the language of business and marketing, marketing because we want to to transition and bring a blockchain from the that that crypto cryptic past to something that people can understand and adopt. And that, and I think if Nier does that, this project could be boss. Well, thank you all for listening. And uh, don't forget to smash that like button and subscribe to us. Bye-bye.